Hey guys, this is Fozon, and in today's lesson, we're going to be discussing the string class, a data type that you're probably familiar with. So our lesson objectives, learn what the string objects are, learn how to construct string objects, learn, and then finally learn how, about the operators and methods applicable to a string object, and then apply them. So what's interesting about the string data type is that although it's not like a, although it's not a primitive type, it kind of acts like a primitive type in the way that it's instantiated. And the way that it's instantiated is kind of a misleading in terms of what its capabilities can be. More specifically, strings are actually string objects, meaning that it's being instantiated through a constructor. Although we don't use the new keyword when we're creating a string object, it is still doing it inherently. Meaning that when we actually change the string, it's we're creating a new string altogether, meaning that it's immutable. Let me provide you an example to illustrate my point. So this is the standard way that we create a string. We have our data type string, we have an identifier named name, and then we have an assignment operator that sets it to the string. What's actually doing is the third statement that you see on this screen. String name is equal to new string, and then in the arguments, it has the string that we are ultimately creating. These two statements are exactly the same. The thing is, is that we're so used to the first statement that we don't recognize what's actually happening in the background. So if it's creating a string object, that means that the string object has methods that we can use. And once we're familiar with those methods, then we could do a lot more algorithms that are dependent on what we can do with the string. So these two statements are the exact same thing. So we can use them interchangeably. Thing is, though, is that this is sort of misleading because it follows the format of a primitive state, a primitive data type, like a Boolean, like a integer or a double. But this is what it's actually doing in the background. It's accessing the constructor of the string class and then creating a string object that has its own instance variables and its own methods. The instance variable being the characters that actually build up a string. And when we're changing the string object, this is this ties back to if it's immutable or not. String objects are immutable. So although it looks like we're simply changing the name, right? So we declare a string name equal to phason. That's a common uh, mis misconception about my name. It's actually phason. But when we uh, reassign it to phoson, right? It looks like it follows the primitive type format, and we're just simply just changing it out. We're replacing it with this. But what's actually happening in the background is that it's creating a new string altogether with the new fix going there. So we're actually accessing the constructor once again, and then we're reconstructing the string. Again, it's very important to realize that strings are actually string objects. Strings are string objects, and we can use the string objects and the methods that are provided within our algorithms. And I also want to mention null and empty strings. Null is just another keyword within the Java programming language, and a null reference simply says that this identifier doesn't point to anything. Now, it's important to note also is that null is spelled exactly like I put it on the, the slides, right? And none of the letters are capitalized. No, this is a Java keyword that the compiler can interpret. It's not a string unless you put two quotation marks around it. So this uh, emphasizes to the identifier that you're not really going to be pointing to anything, but you're still going to exist. So the identifier still exists, but it's not pointing to anything. It's a null pointer. And an empty string is different from a null reference because an empty string uh, emphasizes to the empty keyword, uh, sorry, the empty identifier. The identifier is pointing to a memory location because we're accessing the new string constructor. So if the new string constructor is being invoked, that means we're creating a string object. But since there are no arguments, that means that it, there is nothing there. So it's pointing to a memory location, but there are no characters. That includes spaces. There is no character there. So the difference between no reference and empty string, a no reference says, hey, we're not pointing to anything. We're a null pointer. Empty string, it is pointing to a memory location, but there's nothing in the memory location. 
And then let's go back to concatenation, because concatenation also plays a big role within string objects. As you recall, concatenation is when we combine objects to produce a single string. I know that I spell string incorrectly there, but that's besides the point. At least one of the objects has to be a string object, otherwise an error will occur. So let's look at two examples of concatenation. We have a double pi, and we set that equal to 3.14159. We also have a string words, and this is, well, a string. So one of our values, or rather one of our variables, are strings. So when we concatenate them together, it will work. However, if we have two doubles, none of which are Pi, uh, sorry, none of which are strings, right? We have a double pi, 3.14159. We also have a double pi, 2, 2653589. That's just the other part of the pi statement, whatnot, right? And we want to concatenate those two things together and into a string. It will not work. Why? Because none of those variables are a string. So we would have, what we would have to do is that we would have to add maybe an empty string to this statement. Now, like I said in my objects video, the object class video, every class gets an equal method through the object class because object class is the universal superclass of every single class that you develop. And since the string class is a class, that means it inherits the, va the, inherits the methods from the object class. However, what the string class does is that it overrides it with its own equals method. So if you recall from our object class video, what did the object class's equals method do? It would compare the memory location of each object. And if they were in different memory locations, then it would return false, which is not really practical, especially for strings. Luckily, the string class provides an overridden equals method that compares the string values, not the location of which it's located. It's also important to mention that it's case sensitive. So if you have a capitalized, maybe if you have the same word, but one is uppercase and the other one is lowercase, it's going to return false because the strings are not identical. But if they are ident identical, it would return true. So here's an example. What I did was since it returns a Boolean expression, true or false, we can use it inside an if statement. So we have a string s and we have it set to equal to hello. We have a string t and it's also equal to a string hello. And these are spelled the exact same way in the exact same order. And everything that is uppercase is the same in the other string. And everything that's lowercase is the same in the other string as well. So if we invoke the equals method of one of our strings with the argument being the other string, Right? So when we invoke the equals method, we have to invoke the equals method of a specific string since the, we are invoking the string class's equals method. So S has an equals method, so we have to invoke that. How do we do that? We call it through its identifier. Then we do dot equals. This allows us to access the public equals method of that class. And then the argument is a string argument, aka the string that you're comparing it to to see whether or not if they're identical. So that's the argument. It's a string argument. So you can put the string directly there. You could put this string directly in there, or you could put a variable. It works just the same. And if this is true, then it's going to print out they're identical, else not identical. And since they are identical, it's going to print out they're identical because the if statement here is true. Let's look at another example. We have string s is equal to hello. We have string t also equal to hello. However, what's different from the previous slide is that string t is all lowercase characters, whereas the string s has one uppercase uh, letter. So when we invoke the equals method of string s, what happens? It's going to return uh, false, and then it's going to execute the else statement since the if statement has to be true in order to execute it. And since this if statement is not true, then it goes to the else statement and it prints out not identical. Now the compare to method is also another method within the string class. However, it differs from the equal method because rather than returning a Boolean value such as true or false, it returns an integer value. So if you have one string named my string, and if you have another string named another string, another, str another string being the identifier, poor choice of words on my part, I'm sorry about that. 
but uh, for this matter, another string is the identifier, and my string is another identifier. And we're calling the compare to method of the my string uh, sp string class with the arguments of the string that we're comparing it to. So every string has a compare to method class. So we call it through the identifier. This is where the identifier is dot compare to. That's what we're accessing. That's the method of the string class that we're accessing. And since it's not a static method, we don't have this capital. We don't have the class name. We have the identifier name here. And the arguments is the the string that we're comparing it to. And generally, we're going to have three types of uh, return values, three types, not three values, but three types of values. So we have uh, if whether if we have it, if it's equal to zero, that means that they're identical. They're exactly alike. If they're if uh, if it returns a value greater than sorry, if this value is less than zero, that means that my string is alphabetically comes before another string. And if this value is greater than zero, meaning that whatever it returns is greater than zero, that means that my string alphabetically comes after another string. So if it returns a negative number, the value that you use as your identifier comes before the value that you have in your arguments. If the value that you have if the value that is returned is greater than zero, then the value that you use for the identifier comes after the value that you had as your argument. Length, the, the length method of the string class does exactly what you would think it does. It just simply does integer length. Uh, sorry, it returns an integer, and the integer represents the number of characters in the string. So if you have, let's say, string s is equal to hello, like I used in the previous slide, and then you simply access the length method of the string s class or string s object for that matter, s being the identifier that we used in string, and then we access the length method of this object. What what should it return? Well, how many characters are there? One, two, three, four, five. This also includes spaces. So I know I didn't include spaces for this example, but characters also include spaces. So we would have five because that's how many characters that we have. Spaces are counted as characters. Now, this is a method that you're probably going to use more often, even more on the APCSA exam, and it has very, very powerful applications. Now, there are two, te technically, there's two substring methods, and I'm going to show you how to do the first one. So the first one just simply has one argument. The other one has two arguments, but for this matter, this one has one argument, and this is the start index. This is where you want to start the new string that you want to create. Substring simply creates a new string that is part of the initial string that you had initially. So you're creating a string from an old string and it's going to be partial. And you're going to have a start index and then whatever the value that you had as your start index all the way to the end value is going to be your new substring. So let me do an example. Oh, also, uh, I forgot to mention, the first character of a string is position zero. Now this is introducing to another concept, more specifically when we go into arrays, but just for the purpose of this video, understand this, the first value, the, rather the first character of a string is position zero. We count that as position zero, not one. So here's an example. Let's say if I want to just simply print out course from this string, string course is equal to math course. We have a string because it's in quotation marks. And what if we want to just print out course? So let's find the position of which we want to start at. Well, we're going to start at, well, we're not going to start at math. So we have to avoid math. So this is zero because we start at position zero. This is one, T is two, and then H is three. And then finally, we have C as four. Since we want to start at the C, because that's where course starts, we're going to start at position four. And it's going to go all the way to the end of the string. All the way to the end, meaning it's going to go all the way to the quotation marks. So it's going to print out course, because it starts at uh, the position four character, which is C. Now, another example of the substring method is the one with two arguments, and it returns a string just like the other substring method. 
And what this does is that it returns a new string from the start index to the end index. So you give it two arguments. The first argument is the start index where you want to start the new substring. And the end index is where you want to end the end index. Now it's very important to note that the character that is at the end index is not included. Let me repeat that. The character that you had at the end index is not included. So technically speaking, if you want to rephrase this, the new string will be from the start index because the start index uh, will be also will be counted within our new substring, but the end index will, will not. And then the new string will just simply be from start index all the way to end index minus one inclusive of in end index minus one. And just a remember, another reminder, the first character of a string is position zero, not one. So let's say if you want to print out math rather than course, right? Meaning that we don't want the new substring to go all the way to the end, all the way to the last, to the quotation marks that we see there. Well, we know that already that math is position zero. So that's going to be our start index. Now, if we want to start at like, let's say T, then we would have to do zero, one, two, and then two will be our start index. But for the purpose of this example, we're going to put zero because we want to print out math. So we would have zero as our start index. That's going to be our first argument. And then we want to print out all the way up to H. So we're going to have zero, one, two, three. Okay, but we have to remember that when we use the substring method with two arguments, I know I didn't emphasize that in my title, but I am going to emphasize it within these two arguments, is that it is not inclusive. The argument for the end index is not it will not include the end index within our substring. So we're going to have to add one. So technically speaking, our substring is going to end at 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, C because it does not include C luckily. So it was going to print out math because we told it that we want to end at C. It's not going to include C. It's not going to include the position for character. That's a common mistake that a lot of people make. And finally, we're going to be discussing index of this just finds the first index of a string within another string and then returns the position of where it begins. So it returns an integer, the method name is index of, and then the arguments is string str. So we declare a string and we call it hello. And then we want to print out where the position of which L is located, L being E L L. So what is the where is the position of this word within hello? Well, H nope. E. Okay, so E covers this. So let's see if L L come after it. LL do come after it. Therefore, this is the first instance of L within hello. And since this is the first instance of L, we have to find where the position of E is within that statement. Well, E is 0, 1. Remember, this is position 0. This is position 1. So it's going to print out 1 because position 1 is where the first index of L begins to occur. Let's move on to the compiler and then apply these into the Java programming language. OK, so the first thing that we want to do is show you how we can create the string object in two different ways. So we already know the normal way that we do it, the way that is co commonly misconceived because it looks like a primitive type. So we have this string name one equal to foson, but we also have the, the way that we are taught in this lesson. Let me do another name like that. And then we're going to do a new string. And let's print out foson as well. Now let me print out these two things. Name one. Then let me also just simply copy and then paste that. And then let me replace that with name two. So we have one that's done the kind of the primitive type way in quotation marks, even though string is not a primitive type, despite acting like it when we have this statement. And then we have it the way that it's inherently done through this. So these two statements are the exact same thing. It's just that this just shows that, hey, string is an object. It's not a primitive type. 
Whereas this one, it's like, you know what, we get a cheap pass because, you know, strings are very powerful. Everybody uses strings, so nobody will notice. But for this one, we're like, hey, strings are objects and we have our methods. So let's see if it prints out the exact same thing. And it does print out the exact same thing. They're doing the exact same thing pretty much. And if we change the objects, right, it does the exact same thing as well. So if I do name one is equal to phase on, that's not my name, so please don't call me that. And then let's say if name two is equal to new string. And let me add a space there. And then let me pull that phase on. And then we put our semicolon there. It's going to reflect that change within our print statement. Now, like I said in our video, we also have null, a thing called null references, and we also have a thing called empty strings. So a null reference is literally just null. Now, if you do it like this, it's not going to work. If you do it like this, it's not going to work either. You have to make sure that null is written like this, lowercase characters. An empty string, no arguments. And as you could see, it prints out no for this name one, but at the same time, it doesn't print anything out for name two. This is literally the equivalent of, well, this. Exactly. Now, recall the difference between these two things. No just simply emphasizes that the identifier does not point to any memory location. And an empty string does have a memory location. It's just nothing is there. No characters are stored there, rather. And let's go into concatenation as well. Like I said in my video, we have to make sure that one of them are a string. So if I had, let's say, a double pi and I had it set equal to 3.14159. And let's say if I also had maybe a double pi and then let me equal to maybe 3.14159265358.9. I hope those are the numbers. I don't really recall them, to be honest. And then I try to concatenate those two together. Again, the identifier should be different. What happens? Pi plus pi 2. That's not pi 2. That's pi 2. Okay, let me eliminate this because we no longer have the name 1. And we should get an error. Let's proceed. And we get an exception, unresolved compilation error. We ha can't convert from a double to string. So what happens when we try to put a string? Actually, let me do it at the beginning. Okay. Let me remove that extra mark. Okay. And as you can see, now it's concatenating those two values together. We have a string value. You can also put a variable that's a string, and it will work just the same in that regard. Let's also access the equals method of the string class. So let's say if we have a string s is equal to hello. Let me just simply copy this, since we're going to be using the same hello anyway. And let's name this t. What happens when we access one of the equals method, rather the equals method of one of these string values? So I'm going to access the equals method of the S string. So S has an equals method. And then within the equals method, I want to see whether or not if it's equal to T. And it's going to print either true or false. Hopefully it should print out true because those are the exact same, those are the exact same strings. Let me just directly put hello into here just to show you that it works just the same as well. And we should hopefully print out true because S is in fact equal to hello exactly right in like that. But if we were to change it from capital H to lowercase h, what will happen? Well, it's going to return false because it is case sensitive. As you can see, hello in the string s includes an uppercase s, and then hello within the arguments to see whether or not they're equal to each other is, well, lowercase, and it returns false because it's case sensitive, like I said. Let's also do the 
compares two methods so let me erase this and instead of showing you let me do abc let me call this my string my string let me do uh, another one so that it reflects the names or identifiers that I had in the slide. And then we could do ABC. Then let me do DEF. Let me access the compare to method of the my string class. So my string, we're going to access the string, my string, through the identifier. Then we're going to do compare to. And then we want to compare to another string. So another string. Did I spell that correctly? No, it's not another string. It's another one. Does that work? Okay, so it returns negative three, negative three saying that, hey, my string comes before another one, right? Alphabetically, ABC technically become, be, comes before DEF. And we can simply just put DEF as one of our arguments as well, rather than going the route of the variable. Again, it will work just the same. Let's say if we put the exact same value there, let's see what will happen. And it will return zero. Now let's say if we replace this, a my string with def, and then let's replace def with, I don't know, x, y, z. And then let me put another one back in here. To show you hopefully this should this should release actually let me reverse this uh, okay this should be a negative number but let's say if we reverse this let me save that there let me get that there let me put that there and just to show you that we can get positive numbers as well alrighty that's cool Okay, and we get positive 20 there because my string alphabetically comes after another one. And that's why we get the positive 20 there. It's greater than zero. That's a great way of remembering it. So if it alphabetically comes after the arguments, then it alphabetically comes after the arguments. It's greater than zero. Uh, we can also access the length method of the class, uh, of the string class. So let me print out our values. So let's say if I print out hello, right? And if I access my string dot length, what do we get? One, two, three, four, five, six. That we have six characters, so it should print out a length of six. And when we're doing length calculations, it's going to assume that the position, it's going to assume that the first character is one. Understand that. It's going to return the number of characters. So we do include uh, H as one. But when we're doing substrings, then we consider position, the first position to be zero. So if I say, hello, my name is Fozan. And let's say if I want to re simply remove the hello, well, we have to count and where we have to count where we want our start index. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is going to be my start index. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven is going to be my start index. So my string, that substring. Our start index is going to be 7, and hopefully that should print out my name is Fozon. Because if we give it just the start index, it's going to assume that the end index is just the end of the string that we have currently. And as you can see, it prints out my name is Fozon. Now, if we did 6, it would have included the space there. So as you can see, there's no space between my bar and the string value. But once we do that, it's going to include a space as well. But let's say if I want to simply print out the hello statement, well, we're going to have to provide two arguments for it. We're going to have to provide a start index and an end index. So if I want to just print out hello, I need a start index of what? Zero, right? Because since hello starts at zero, so we're going to have zero. 
but I also want to end at the exclamation point. So we're going to do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, but we want to include the exclamation point. So since position 5 is our exclamation point, we have to increment 5 by 1, 6. Because what the substring method with the two arguments does is that if we're given an end index, if we give it rather an end index, it's not going to include the end index within our substring. So we want to include, we want to include the exclamation point, and that's at position 5. So we tell the compiler that we want to end at position 6, and it's not going to include this space, even though you probably won't see it within our end statement. Actually, just to show you, I might as well just remove this. And hopefully it should print out hello. Finally, I want to show you within the compiler how to check for index of. So if I actually let me just use this example for this matter, right? And then I access my string dot maybe index of. Let's say if I ask for the index of hello, then it's going to give me position well zero. But if I ask it for let's say a position of hello it's going to give me position 1. We can further expand upon this and say, hey, let's find the position of foson. And that's going to be a long calculation, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Actually, let me, uh, let me find out what it is. It's 18. Let's see if it's true. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So yes, that is the start index. 18 is our start index. But let's say if it can't find the value that we want. So let me put that there. That's a string that's not within our string value. So if we try to access it, what does it return? It returns a negative 1 or a value that is less than 0. That's important to mention because less than 0 can be the way that you can determine whether or not if a string is within your value, or rather if a string is within your string. That wraps up my video on the string class. I hope that this makes strings more useful and more practical within your algorithms.